Thank you very much. My teachers at Oxford were often going on about <coughs> the fact that the furthest east that any uh, Orientalist needed to go was Leipzig. And the reason for this was that it was considered that people studying the east didn't really need to go there. You could study the people and the place from a distance and particularly in a library. And it just so happens that Leipzig is the most easterly of the great European Orientalist libraries. But I'm not that kind of scholar. I've had a lot of adventures in my life and I've had uh, a lot of journeys. And the most exciting of these, in many ways, and this is really rather surprising and astonishing, was in Africa. Now, why should this be surprising? It's surprising because I am a student of Jewish studies, and particularly remote Jewish communities throughout the world. And whereas, of course, there were Jews in places like Europe and the Caucasus and Central Asia, and, of course, on the, uh, the Silk Route as far as China, there were no Jews in pre-modern times in black Africa, with the exception of one or two references in very, very dodgy medieval texts suggesting that there might be some lost cities and the occasional Jewish king somewhere in the heart of the unknown continent. This is how it happened. I was asked to go to South Africa to give a lecture at the University of Witwatersrand, and um, it was a hall a bit like this. The place was full of very well-dressed, affluent-looking white South Africans, and they listened very attentively, sitting in their comfortable, well-upholstered chairs to what I had to say. But at the back of the hall, there was quite a large group of very poorly dressed black people, shoeless, but they were wearing uh, little black skull caps. And after my lecture, I went across, introduced myself, and we started to chat. And they explained that they were members of the Lemba tribe. And then, to my great astonishment again, they said that they were black Jews who'd come hundreds or perhaps thousands of years before into Africa from somewhere in the north and from a city that they referred to as Sena. And they had a kind of epic poem which they started chanting to me and it went something like this. We are the white men who came from Sena. We crossed Pusela. We crossed the sea. We came to Africa, we rebuilt Sena. We are the white men who came from Sena. We followed the star, we carried the ark. Pretty amazing song. And then they said that they would like me to go and visit them. And they lived six or seven hours north of where we were, right up uh, against the, the frontier with Zimbabwe in little thatched villages. And off I went and spent a little time there, several days. And at night, I would sit out with the old men and they would tell me stories of their journey across Africa, of their Jewish customs, of their circumcision rites and their ritual slaughter of animals. And most astonishingly, they told me how their priests, because there was a priestly clan, how their priests carried something like the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders on poles right across uh, the continent. Well, it was a pretty amazing story, and I was amazed as a Jewish scholar that I didn't know about it. There is no more historically conscious people in the world than the Jews. And yet in the whole realm of Jewish scholarship, there was no mention of these people and these 
remarkable stories. So I felt that I absolutely had to find out whether these people were genuinely Jewish in the first place, and I wondered if this was possible, and I also needed to find out where their lost city of Senna was. I decided to try and do this, and um, a few months later, I started off on a journey uh, which took me right across Africa, and the idea of the journey, in a way, was to follow the oral tradition of this tribe in reverse, because the oral tradition was extre extremely complete and very precise, and it worked as an amazingly good roadmap. And so off I set, and it took me through South Africa and Zimbabwe, and then Malawi, Tanzania, and finally into Mozambique, and then I got to the sea. And then the clues simply dried up. There was nothing there that could help me find the original Senna, which was somewhere across this sea, somewhere in the north. But while I was on the coast, I found near the mouth of the Zambezi River some great monumental chunks of stone. And a few days later in Zanzibar, I was rootling around in a library, came across some old Arabic texts, and I was able to deduce that these stones were the last remnant of a city which had existed there by the name of Seyuna. Now, I was pretty sure that this Seyuna would have been the second Senna of the Lemba. They left Senna, they crossed the sea, came to Africa and rebuilt this Senna, Sayuna. But it also occurred to me that this Sayuna was the same as the Arabic for the word Zion, like an African Zion. And when I thought that, a cold shiver went down my spine. It was a very exciting moment. But still, I had no way at that point of trying to discover the original Senna. And it was only the following year when I was in the Yemen, in South Arabia, doing a book on the Jews of the Yemen, that I had another clue. And this happened by chance. I was having lunch with a Muslim cleric in Tarim, a holy city in the Hadramut, which is that valley that crosses right across South Arabia. And I told him what I'd been doing. I told him the story of the Lemba, the story of their crossing from Senna, crossing Posela, rebuilding um, Senna, and so on. And the cleric clapped his hands together, and he said, I think I've got a hunch. I think I know where your, your Senna is. And he told me that he'd heard that right at the end of the wadi, going towards Mehra and Oman, there was indeed a lost city, or the remnants of a lost city, uh, in the desert, partially covered by sands, and there was a local tradition that when the original population had to leave because the dam there broke, they went to Africa. So I jumped into a Land Rover, a few days later I was there, discovered the, this lost city of Senna, and talking to the Bedouin tribes who lived in the vicinity, I was astonished to discover that their tribal names were exactly the same as the clan names of the Lemba tribe right on the other side of, of Africa, thousands and thousands of miles away. So this seemed to me to be a reasonable indication that this indeed was the, uh, the tribe, this was, the, the, this was really the, the lost city of, the, uh, of this tribe. And then they told me that when they'd left the city, when the population had left the city, they followed a valley called the Masila down to the sea, and then they took a boat which took them to Africa. And I thought, well, maybe the Masila is the Pusela of their oral tradition. But still, it was close. I wasn't entirely satisfied that I had the proof. It wasn't exactly a smoking gun. So I had the idea that maybe what 
seem to be pretty impossible by regular means might be made possible by using genetics. And so I went back to London and I had quite a number of geneticist friends, told them what the problem was historically, and we agreed to do a project together. And so we did a big collect in the, in the Hadramaut, collected a lot of data, and then we went to Africa, did control um, uh, collects, and a huge collection from the Lemba tribe itself, took the data back to London, into the lab, and a couple of weeks later they called me in, we sat down, we looked at the information that was coming, uh, coming out, and to my great gratification and excitement, there was a real overlap between the population of the Lemba and the population of the Eastern Hadramaut. Well, this was pretty exciting because it seemed to me that I had therefore proved that where the original Senna of the Lemba was good. I had also proved that their tradition, which said that they had come from the north, presumably from Arabia, was true. But there was the other question. Were they Jewish? Now, a couple of years before, I'd collaborated on another paper which had to do with the Jewish priesthood. Now, it Jewish priest is called Cohen. Everybody here knows somebody called Mr. Cohen. Now, Mr. Cohen, in theory, would be descended from the original priests who two and a half thousand years ago officiated in the temple in Jerusalem. That was the idea. So we did a big, we did a big, a big experiment. We collected many, many Cohens from all over the world. And what we discovered really was a corroboration of this tradition that over half of the Cohen population descended from a particular individual and that particular individual lived somewhere in the area of Palestine, Israel, 3,000 years ago. 3,000 years ago is more or less the time when Moses lived and it was Moses' brother, Aaron, who was the founder of the priesthood. So this was a pretty neat piece of research. And a particular haplotype, a particular signature, a family signature of the Cohens was known to exist and did exist. So then, when we started looking more closely at the stuff coming out of the Lemba DNA, in one of the clans, their priestly clan, you remember the clan that carried something like the Ark over Africa, what did we discover? We discovered that the same proportion of that clan had this rare haplotype as did Cohen's throughout the world. Again, this was a, a pretty extraordinary moment. So it was fair to say that the, uh, the orig origins of the Lemba were indeed Jewish. We knew where Senna was and we knew how they got there more or less. The implications of this piece of research were quite considerable. They were certainly significant for the Lemba people because when they were first discovered or come across in the 19th century by British colonists, they were forced pretty much to become Christians, like everybody else in the area. As soon as the DNA research came through, they stopped, in many cases, being Christian. They abandoned the church and they started creating synagogues. So in terms of their identity, the genetic research was massively influential. And so it seemed to me that this kind of research, at least in my area, was possible of delivering not only a kind of historical authenticity, but also a sort of social justice. In another case, uh, I had been working with a tribe of so-called maybe Jews, small black men who live in, uh, in and around Mumbai in Western India, who'd always been absolutely on the fringe of anything Jewish and nobody took their claim to be Jewish in any way seriously. And we did a big DNA-based uh, uh, piece of research on this group 
And we discovered that indeed their claim to be of an Israelite population was true. And the night that this was uh, revealed, there'd been a huge article in the, in, the in the Times of India the day before, uh, the people spilled out into the street and they were singing and they were dancing and they were rejoicing all night. As one of them said to me afterwards, it was as if the Messiah had come. They felt a sense of vindication, a sense of authenticity, which they'd never had before. One of the other impacts was that this kind of technology and this way of looking at history spread all over the world, of course, through the internet. And one day I was um, in my hotel room in Sydney. I, I was lecturing at the University of Sydney. The telephone goes and somebody is calling from uh, Papua New Guinea and he describes himself as being the spiritual head of a particular tribe called the Gogodala who live in the western part of Papua New Guinea in the Fly River estuary. And he explained to me that he'd seen on the internet the stuff that I'd done on the Lemba and he wanted me to prove for the world that his tribe in the Fly Swamp were also of Jewish ancestry and the following day he arrived from Papua New Guinea and he came into the hotel room bearing a large black hat and he plucked out of the hat a hair and inside the hat there were another 500 he'd taken a hair from 500 members of his tribe and he wanted me to take the hair back to London so DNA could be extracted from the from the roots. Well, in the event, not very surprisingly, uh, the research that I subsequently did some 10 years ago on this particular hypothesis didn't um, prove to be satisfactory to the Jewish claims of the, uh, of the Gogodala tribe. The Gogodala people are a small tribe of hunter-gatherers who live in the far western province of Papua New Guinea. It is one of the most unexplored places in one of the most unexplored countries in the world. The story the Gogodala tell of their origins begins with their ancestors' long journey by canoe to a scattering of lush islands set in this tropical lagoon. Thousands of years later, the Gogodala are still here, still mostly hunter-gatherers, still using canoes as their main means of transportation around the lagoon, still cut off from the rest of the world. Now they are making an extraordinary claim that has attracted the attention of scholars and religious groups from around the world. The Gogodala say they are one of the lost tribes of Israel. They say the Jewish holy book, the Torah, is their story. And after thousands of years in an Eden all to themselves, the Gogodala now say they want to go home to Israel. FIU Religious Studies professor Tudor Parfit is an expert on lost Jewish tribes. In March 2013, he took his third trip to Papua New Guinea to visit the Gogodala. To Professor Parfit, the Gogodala's claim to an Israeli ancestry is actually part of a worldwide phenomenon tied to colonialism and the influence of Christian missionaries. In religious studies, we talk about syncretism which is the way in which different uh, religious traditions can come together and form a new sort of religious uh, entity. And this is what we have here. The bedrock, I think, of the uh, religious identity of the Gokudala remains in some respects their traditional belief system upon which has been grafted um, Christianity, which was introduced to this previously cannibalistic tribe in the 1950s. 
Now, on top of that, it's been grafted a kind of uh, Judaism. So it's interesting to see that they, they now, many of them wear yarmulkes. Um, they've recently acquired prayer shawls. They've started um, celebrating quite specifically Jewish holidays, like Passover, for instance, and, and Hanukkah. The Gogodala say they have always been Jews. In fact, their original ancestors, they say, came from Jerusalem. Uh, and our ancestors believe, uh, they passed on the story that we, we traveled, traveled in that uh, canoes. The canoes came from a place called Yebisaba. Uh, we believe that uh, Yebisaba is, uh, is in Israel, which is uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem at this time. Because at that time, that place was still known as Yabis. And uh, that's our, our ancestors and our forefathers told us that that's our homeland. And uh, we, we will return one day to that place, Yabisaba, in the West. In the West, in the West. But I found it was utterly fascinating that a tribe which until 1950 had been um, cannibalistic and which was still largely hunter-gatherer should by 2000 and whatever it was be using the internet to invoke genetics to try and prove an Israelite identity and so I've been following their pro progress since and um, despite the negative uh, DNA work uh, they're still quite convinced that they're Jewish and their practices of Judaism increase as the years go on. So what does that prove? It tends to prove anyway that positive, positive identifications through DNA have a very, very big impact upon identity, as we have in the case of the Lemba, and as we have in the case of the group from Mumbai in Western India. In the case of the Gogodala, the, uh, the results were somewhat negative, but they didn't seem to uh, particularly impact. Over the last, let's say, 13 years, uh, historians have been handed a new tool of research. It's a very uh, powerful tool uh, of research. In the past, the study of history was always in the hands of a kind of elite. But now, uh, with the history book that everybody carries in their DNA, which is a very kind of democratic uh, kind of history, uh, whole new worlds are going to open up, both, of, both in terms of the way that we view history and finally, I think, about the way that we view ourselves.